Welcome to chapter 23, the digestive system. The purpose of the digestive system is to take food that you eat and break it down into smaller pieces, then absorb it into the blood so it can go to the rest of the body. So throughout the process of the digestive system, I want you to ask yourself, at each step along the way, is mechanical digestion or chemical digestion, or both, taking place here? Mechanical digestion would be mechanically, physically breaking things down into smaller pieces. Chemical digestion, as its name suggests, would be chemically breaking the food down into smaller pieces using usually things like enzymes. So at each step along the way, we'll ask mechanical, chemical, and go from there. You can see the overall digestive system here, and most of it is found in the abdominal cavity. Let's start briefly with the mouth. But before we get there, let's think about the musculature of the digestive system and all the tubing. You can see here a couple of different layers of muscles. We have an outer layer of muscle here running longitudinally, so along with the digestive tract. Then there's an inner circular layer of muscle. Then underneath that is another longitudinal layer. So multiple layers of muscles running in different directions, and collectively they get food moved along the system. So really they can contract in most any direction you can imagine. There's a lot of nerves running this system, and what you see in this visual is a little bit of esophagus coming in from the top, then the stomach, and the stomach going into the small intestines, and all the yellow and blue stuff you see there are nerves. So a significant uh, amount of nerve activity and presence going on there. In the mouth, what kind of digestion is going to happen in the mouth? The options are mechanical and chemical. So you're probably thinking, obviously mechanical with teeth, and that's correct. The teeth would chop and grind the food into smaller pieces. Is the tongue doing anything with digestion in the mouth? Perhaps you've never paid attention to your tongue as you were chewing up something, but the next time you're eating, pay attention to what the tongue is doing. It's actually constantly moving and stirring the food around to ensure that you get equal mechanical digestion to all the food in the mouth. So stirring it around so the teeth can get to everything. But also you have chemical digestion happening in the mouth with the release of saliva. If you were to think about something that tastes really, really good to you, whatever your favorite food might be, for me, chocolate chip cookies, especially if they're fresh, or even the raw cookie dough is actually even better, always sounds good. So if you think about for a minute your favorite foods, imagine having a plate full of that in front of you in its most wonderful form. And what you might feel is a sort of a funny tingling sensation occurring up underneath the tongue, then towards the back of the mouth in front of the ears. And that's the release of saliva. So saliva is going to be a chemical digestion for food happening in the mouth. And as the tongue is stirring the food to help with mechanical digestion, that's also stirring the saliva around. So the tongue is just a stirrer to make sure that both mechanical, mechanical and chemical digestion can happen well here. If we were to examine the tongue, what we would find are lots of rough, bumpy surfaces, little papilla, and basically those are where you're going to find taste buds. So all of the different tastes that can be detected by your tongue, remember the sweet, sour, salty, and bitter tastes, those are detectable by those taste buds on the tongue. They're also found to some degree in the back of the throat, but most of the concentration of taste buds is going to be on the tongue itself. So the tongue stirs things to help with mechanical and chemical digestion, and it provides taste. Taste is really what makes eating so much fun. If we look at the mouth from the side, we can see the three different sets of salivary glands here. The large set here right in front of the ears is the parotid gland. And this is the largest of the three types. So right there, that's what's going to give you that strange sensation at the back of the mouth uh, in front of the ears when that's releasing its saliva here through what you see is the parotid duct. The second 
set of uh, salivary glands here are the submandibular. They're going to be found down here at the bottom of the mandible or the lower jaw. And that's going to release uh, things, again, probably towards the back of the mouth more. Then the sublingual gland right here underneath the tongue is going to be the third salivary gland involved in the process. And all of those are going to be involved every time you release saliva. So you can see you have a large supply of saliva available to you all the time. And sometimes only a simple thing like thinking about food is sufficient to trick the salivary glands into releasing their product. Lots of muscles going on here to help move the jaws, to move the tongue, and that sort of thing for the mechanical part. If we think about teeth, you know about baby teeth and adult teeth. So baby teeth are the teeth that a child will get in the first uh, starting in the first couple of years of life and really running up uh, into the age perhaps of uh, 10 years old or maybe a little bit older, um, some of those baby teeth will stick around. Their initial functionality is to stimulate continued production of milk with mechanical stimulation to the nipple and breast of the mother, but also it prepares the child to start eating solid food. So once teeth start showing up in the jaws, that suggests that biologically the child is ready to start eating something other than milk. So moving into the solid food realm because now it has something to chew it up with. Those teeth start falling out at a later date and are then replaced with adult teeth. And there will be far more adult teeth than there are baby teeth because now there's room for it. So you start out with a small number of small teeth in a baby because there's not much room to put those teeth. And as they age, they can start putting adult teeth in there in place of those permanent teeth. Until, as you can see here, incisors, canines, molars of various varieties show up there. So the teeth towards the front are going to be for slicing and cutting. And then the teeth at the back are going to be more of a grinding function. Those teeth, hopefully, as an adult, will remain for the rest of your adult life. If we look at a tooth here, we see the crown is the part that actually protrudes out of the jaw. So the crown is the visible part of the tooth. Then there's a neck that's actually in the gums, and the root of the tooth is down in the bone of the jaw. The outer layer is enamel, so it's very, very hard stuff. That's the, the white part of the tooth that you see. If you happen to get a cavity that hurts, that means that the bacteria and the enzymes they produce have dissolved through the enamel and reached the dentin or perhaps the pulp where we find nerves. So that's a relatively sensitive and delicate part of the tooth. The, the enamel is really designed to seal and keep all that inside. So if a cavity forms, the dentist has to clean out all the infection and then try to cap it off to replace the enamel that was damaged. What's really holding the tooth in the jaw is a very short ligament down here. We see at the root basically is the periodontal ligament. So it's a relatively short length ligament that's anchoring the tooth to the bone. And when a tooth falls out, basically that means that ligament has died, allowing it to become loose. So when those baby teeth are falling out, the periodontal ligaments are dying, the teeth get loose, they fall out, and away you go. If the dentist has to pull a tooth, basically they have to rip the tooth out of that bony cavity, ripping and tearing loose the periodontal ligament to allow that tooth to come out. Now obviously when you're ripping out that, it's associated with nerves coming out of the tooth, and that possibly could hurt, so they often use the painkillers. I've always said drugs are good. The problem is when they wear off. But while you're under the influence of those drugs, you really can't feel a whole lot going on in the mouth. And you're always wondering, is what I just put in there dripping out? Am I drooling on myself? Or is everything actually in my mouth? So that's always a funny feeling and one of the negative effects of the wonderful drugs. Once the food is done in the mouth, you swallow, and that's the last point at which you have any sort of conscious control over the food and where it goes. From there on out, it's under automatic control of the body, and so wish all you want, but once you swallow, it's automatic from there, and you're at the mercy 
of your digestive system and what it chooses to do. The esophagus is the tube leading from the mouth to the stomach, and it is a somewhat muscular tube that stays in a relatively closed position. So here you can see that there is a lumen or an opening in the middle of the esophagus, but it's mostly closed, and then the esophagus has the ability to open up significantly as food passes through. So when you swallow, it leaves the mouth, and the esophagus, being quite muscular, will squeeze the food down that esophagus until it gets to the stomach. This means you can actually stand on your head and swallow something, and it will go to your stomach against gravity. This works really handy if you're an astronaut, for, for example, and you're in space. No gravity to pull food down to the stomach. And so because you have this muscular esophagus, you don't have to float upside down when you swallow something and then let it float to the stomach. The esophagus will push even liquids against the gravity to get to the stomach. So here's that process of swallowing here. So step one is you've got the bolus of food. Basically it's a ball of food that's quite liquid, or, or not necessarily so liquid, but quite sticky, fairly moist in consistency. Then the tongue throws that bolus to the back of the mouth, initiating the swallowing reflex. It goes down the uh, pharynx that we have seen earlier in chapter 22. And just like with the epiglottis deciding if something goes down the esophagus or the trachea for breathing, the same sort of decision is made for swallowing. And hopefully it's going to close over the trachea, making that food go down the esophagus to the stomach. So that contraction wave in the esophagus will push that food on down. When you get down to the stomach, there is a sphincter. A sphincter is a circular muscle. So the gastroesophageal sphincter is designed to make sure that once something goes into the stomach, hopefully it stays there. So it prevents um, food and other stuff in the stomach, stomach acid, from hopefully splashing back up into the esophagus. Occasionally, though, if you eat too much or you have bad posture, things like that, you experience acid reflux. And uh, that's not something, uh, generally you call that perhaps heartburn on the street, that's not something you enjoy because that's when the gastroesophageal sphincter failed, allowing stomach acid to splash back up into the esophagus, which is not prepared to handle that acidic material, and uh, then it can become quite painful. So if you have regular acid reflux problems, you probably should look at why is that, because that can lead to things like esophageal cancer. And if you get a cancer there in the esophagus, just out of the stomach, that means that cancer really is inches from the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the large intestine, the small intestine, all of those critical organs, they're all within a couple of inches of that developing cancer. Meaning esophageal cancer is quite difficult to treat. It often quickly spreads to other organs and typically, by the time it's discovered, has spread to other areas and is probably at that point no longer overly treatable. So heartburn is more than just an inconvenience. If you experience it more than on occasion, you probably should do something about uh, taking a look at that. And often treating with antacids actually makes it worse, not better. Once you're inside the stomach, you can see that the stomach has multiple layers of muscle, and its job is to mix as well. So let's back up and remember that in the mouth, we had mechanical and chemical digestion. What kind of digestion did we have in the esophagus? Your answer is also mechanical and chemical. Once the food reaches the stomach, that bolus gets to the stomach, we have the addition of stomach acid. That stomach acid is going to take that very moist ball of food and turn it into what we call chyme. Chyme is basically liquid food. So the stomach acid does two things. One is it sterilizes the food. No matter what conditions your food was prepared under, it potentially contains pathogenic organisms. So the stomach acid helps to sterilize that. This is why at Thanksgiving time, most cases of food poisoning for the year occur, because we're all eating too much, meaning that the stomach acid is not able to properly sterilize all the food we put in there. We've also probably gotten sloppy with food handling and preparation techniques, and especially food storage techniques, so... This just really adds to the compounding problem. 
The second most common time of food poisoning for the year is 4th of July. Not necessarily because you're overeating so much there, but because all the food is left out on the picnic table and it sits there in the nice warm conditions for too long and then you go ahead and eat some more of it. So we get sterilization in the stomach. But that stomach acid is also going to start to liquefy fat and start the breaking down of protein. The stomach then stores the food until the small intestines are ready for it. So when we talk about gastric retention time, we're talking about how long is that food in the stomach. And if you think about what you might consider an average gastric retention time, ask yourself how long is there typically between traditional meal times? Your average answer comes out to around four hours. So the average gastric retention time of food might be roughly four hours. Certain kinds of foods might move more quickly through the stomach. For example, a high-carb meal might not stick around the stomach quite so long because it liquefies very easily. A high-protein, high-fat meal might stick around longer because it takes a longer time to liquefy proteins and fats and then get them ready for the next step along the way. At the far end of the stomach here we see the pyloric sphincter. The job of that sphincter is to release the contents of the stomach a little bit at a time. It's sort of going to squirt into the what's labeled here as duodenum, which is the beginning of the small intestine. So it's going to accept from the stomach there as the small intestine has space a little bit at a time. So over that four hour period, a little bit at a time, that food is squirting into the small intestines. The stomach acid is produced here in what you see as the gastric glands and gastric pits. So that's going to produce the hydrochloric acid that then is released into the stomach. But those cells are lined with a special layer of mucus. You see what are labeled here as mucus neck cells. So those cells are going to produce mucus which helps to protect the actual tissue of the stomach from the acid. This image is what happens when that layer of protection is damaged. So this is what a stomach ulcer would look like. Basically a hole in the stomach. So if that acid finds its way into contact with actual stomach tissues, so it gets past the layer of mucus, it starts to chemically burn its way through the stomach. And this is why ulcers are often painful. Because that acid is burning the tissues that have nerves in it, and you're very well aware that there's a problem. Too often people put it off until they can't stand the pain anymore, and really what that's allowed to happen is that hole in the stomach to get bigger. If you're able to ignore it for a really long time, you might actually have it burn all the way through the stomach itself, and stomach contents then start pouring out into the rest of the abdominal cavity. Obviously that wouldn't be a good thing, so uh, if you think there's a stomach ulcer there, get it checked out. It's a relatively simple process to look and see if it's there, and a relatively simple process to fix it. The question is what causes stomach ulcers? And if you ask grandma what caused stomach ulcers, or maybe Uncle Harold what causes stomach ulcers, they might say things like stress, or acidic foods, or certain other things in life. And those are all things that certainly cause the symptoms of ulcers to flare up and be worse, but that's not really the underlying cause. The underlying cause are the bacteria you see here on the screen now. Helicobacter pylori. And it was only in the early to mid-90s that the idea of what really causes stomach ulcers was figured out. So it's no surprise that a lot of folks would have the misbelief that it's caused by what you eat or your stress or things like that. So these bacteria happen to be resistant to stomach acid. Again, we said that stomach acid was there to sterilize, but this particular bacteria doesn't mind stomach acid. And it's often present in people and doesn't cause problems, but when it does cause problems, it chews through that mucus protective layer and then exposes the stomach tissue to the acid. Then you start feeling that there's a problem there. So really the treatment for stomach acid, is, or for uh, stomach ulcers rather, is not to avoid certain foods or to de-stress, although that might be a good idea, but the solution is to take an antibiotic which will kill that particular bacteria and typically in a matter of weeks the stomach is able to heal itself and move on with life.
Here's the idea of how the stomach mixes things. So we're going to say that the stomach is chemical digestion with the stomach acid and also mechanical digestion with stirring, mixing, sloshing everything around in the stomach. It's important to note here as well that certain components of your food are digested at different places. So carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are digested in different ways. So in the mouth and the esophagus, you had carbohydrate digestion. Carbohydrate digestion stops in the stomach because the enzymes that assist in that process are inactivated by the stomach acid. So fats and proteins begin to be digested in the stomach. There's a long list of things here that influence the rate of stomach emptying or its, its process of dumping into the small intestines. And the things that we have any say in really are our diet and what we put into the stomach in the first place. So we can say that high fat foods increase gastric retention time. Caffeine increases gastric retention time. Alcohol increases gastric retention time. So if you eat a high fat diet, or a diet high in caffeine or alcohol, that's going to cause food to stay in the stomach longer. And the longer the food stays there, the more likely you are to experience the heartburn, the acid reflux. Other contributing factors to heartburn besides how long the food is there is your posture. Are you sitting up straight or are you hunched over? If you're hunched over, that's putting more pressure on the stomach, squeezing things more strongly towards the esophagus, perhaps out of the stomach. Overeating will stretch the esophageal sphincter and uh, prevent it from closing well. And sometimes people just have a weak esophageal sphincter. And if that's the case, they quickly learn that they can't eat more than an hour or two uh, before bedtime because when they lay down, that weak sphincter might allow things to leak back into the esophagus. Once we're in the small intestines, the small intestines are going to pick up and continue carbohydrate digestion. They will also continue and finish protein and fat digestion. And to do that, we need the addition of enzymes. So what we call accessory organs of digestion, we typically would consider the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. So here you see the liver. An actual size of the liver, as you can see in the drawing in the upper left-hand corner, it's quite large. It takes up a lot of space in there because it's making so many digestive enzymes. And that's just a piece of the puzzle though. Because the nutrients that are absorbed by the small intestines go to the liver for processing. And pretty much anything that enters the body will at some point find its way to the liver where it might be further metabolized. So it's a large chunk of tissue doing a lot of active work. Down here at the bottom you can see the gallbladder sticking out a little bit. This real one here. If we go to a drawing and look at it from the back side, it's a little easier to see the gallbladder hanging down there and with it the bile duct. And you've no doubt heard about the bile duct before. Occasionally it gets blocked because the point of the gallbladder is to hold concentrated bile, which is the digestive enzymes produced by the liver. So it holds it in large quantities so that if you happen to eat, let's say, a fried chicken meal with some really buttery mashed potatoes and some fried greens and a good southern meal, you need a lot of bile to process all that fat that came in. So the gallbladder essentially stores the bile so when it's needed, it's ready to dump in. Sometimes diet problems or other issues cause gallbladder issues. If you've heard of gallstones before, that's when the bile starts to solidify. Then it stops up the bile duct and you have a high fat meal and the body can't really process it so well. That often expresses as pain and perhaps diarrhea and some other issues and you go to the doctor for that and they might remove the gallbladder, which is about a 30 minute surgery. They'll blow up the abdominal cavity like a balloon with carbon dioxide, laparoscopically remove the gallbladder, seal off the bile duct and then uh, remove the equipment. The fun part of that is that carbon dioxide will bubble through the body for perhaps a week or so after the surgery, often coming out through the shoulders, and I'm told that it's a very painful experience. 
So hopefully you would never have to experience that. The surgery itself, not a big deal, but the after effects will last for a while. Once the gallbladder is removed, you do need to remember that you don't have bile stored up. So if you eat a high fat meal, you'll discover that the digestive process that normally takes around 24 hours from start to finish now might only take about 30 minutes. Meaning 30 minutes after you swallow the food, it's exiting the body at the anus with a bowel movement. So you will learn that no fat for a while and then slowly ease your way back into having some fat in your diet and the liver will eventually learn that the gallbladder is no longer there and it will start making the bile faster and it's not that you can never eat fried chicken again but you might want to take six to eight months or more to ease back into that sort of diet and then the liver will be able to pick up and probably work pretty well from there. If we look inside the liver we have what are called lobules little functional units of the liver and what I want you to see here is there's a tremendous blood supply. The red tubing here is arterioles, so small arteries, coming in giving blood supply and there's a huge venous supply here. All the blue tubing is veins, so taking the blood back out of the system. We also have the bile ducts coming in there to pick up the bile that's produced. So lots of metabolic activity going on in the liver and lots of blood supply to support that. If you slice through the liver you'd see just lobule after lobule after lobule here. So lots and lots of those functional units. And fortunately the liver is pretty good at repairing itself if you damage it as long as you don't go past the point of no return. Here's a view of the liver with gallbladder and the bile duct there, and then the second secondary organ of digestion, the pancreas. Everybody knows the pancreas makes insulin, and that's one part of its job, but it also makes a number of other digestive enzymes. It then plugs in through the main pancreatic duct, joining up with the bile duct, and you see here in the duodenum, the tubing enters the small intestine just a few inches, after it comes out of the stomach where all those other enzymes are dumped in and now carbohydrates can finish digestion proteins and fats can finish digestion so perhaps for the first half of the small intestines you might be focused mostly on finishing digestion perhaps the second half of the small intestines might focus more on absorption so the intestine the small intestines job is to finish digestion and to absorb nutrients If we look inside the small intestine, it has a number of folds and grooves inside, meaning as the food moves along, it's getting stirred again. So if we mixed in the mouth, we mixed in the esophagus, we mixed in the stomach, we're mixing in the small intestines too. So we have both mechanical and chemical digestion occurring in the small intestines. As the food passes through, it goes over those grooves and gets stirred around. And what's happening here is we're trying to equally stir in all of those liver and pancreas enzymes. And we're trying to make sure that the villi have equal opportunity to absorb nutrients from all of the food passing through. If we look on a villi, then we have microvilli. So here's a villi cell that we're seeing over here, and it's covered in microvilli, sometimes called the brush border. So the total surface area of the small intestines is incredible. If, just like we saw with breathing and gas exchange, absorption of nutrients is a surface area dependent function as well, we probably have perhaps somewhere around a football field of total surface area in the small intestines with having villi on top of villi on top of villi to help to absorb nutrients more effectively. Once the food leaves the small intestines it enters the large intestines over here uh, down here where we would find the appendix. So here's where the small intestines would come in. When the food was in the small intestines it was completely liquid. It enters the large intestines, and I'll use the word large intestines, I'll also use the word colon. Colon and large intestines are really the same thing. So what we find here is the food goes up, 
the uh, into the large intestines up the ascending colon. So this part over here on the right side of your abdominal cavity is the ascending colon. The job of the appendix down here, as best as we can figure, is to store bacteria. The main function of the large intestines is to allow bacteria to eat whatever we couldn't. And perhaps we can then get some sort of nutritional value from what the bacteria are able to produce. If you look at the dry weight of fecal material, over 95% of the dry weight of fecal material, so feces minus water, over 95% of that is bacteria. Most of those are E. coli. So before this, you have known of E. coli as causing food poisoning, and if it gets in the wrong place, certainly it does, but in the large intestines, it's a normal resident, causing no problems whatsoever there, as long as it's the right kind. So currently, your large intestines are stocked with Kentucky, Tennessee E. coli, and that's fine. But if you were to go, let's say, to Mexico on some sort of adventure, and you're exposed to Mexican E. coli, well, that's a different story. If they get into the large intestines, they will take up a battle, it will be an all-out war, between the Kentucky-Tennessee E. coli and the Mexican E. coli. And the Mexican E. coli, over the course of a week, will win. But in the process, it causes bloody, explosive, very inconvenient diarrhea, Perhaps you've heard it referred to as Montezuma's Revenge. And so when you go to Mexico and anywhere in the world really other than the United States, you might be exposed to a different variety of E. coli, so avoid drinking the water and things that are washed with the water and might avoid some of those problems for you. But after that week or so, the Mexican E. coli has won, and now you say, oh, I feel better. Life is good. Let's go back home. Then when you come back home to Tennessee or Kentucky, Guess what? It's a two-for-one special. Tennessee and Kentucky E. coli enter the system and start fighting with the Mexican E. coli. They eventually win, and the system stabilizes. But now you've gone through another week of very unpleasant experience, getting the system reset again. So if you must go places like Mexico, and especially places that don't have always the best of hygiene and sanitary conditions, certainly be careful what you put into the system because it will go to the intestines. So the ascending colon, the liquid material is moving up the ascending colon. Then it gets to the transverse colon up here at the top. And the transverse colon is running right underneath the rib cage there in the diaphragm. And as it moves across here, it's going from what was very liquid down in the ascending colon, and the transverse colon is getting a little bit more sludgy and perhaps might be getting a little bit close to what we would consider a finished product of feces. When it reaches the left side of the body cavity, it enters the descending colon and that goes down the left side of the body until it reaches about the left hip, does an S curve as the sigmoid colon, then ends at the rectum and anus. So by the time you're in the descending colon, that material that was completely watery at the beginning of the digestive process in the large intestines is now hopefully finished product feces. So the job of the large intestines was to form feces. Most of that was by removing water from the feces. At this point, your body may have added five liters or more of water and other liquids to this food product, so the intestines need to remove most of that hopefully forming appropriate fecal material. So the question on the table now is, what is an appropriate consistency for fecal material? How moist should it be? How much water should the large intestines remove? The answer to that is quite simple to determine, and that is to say that a bowel movement, emptying of the large intestines and the feces that is formed, should require no effort, meaning you give permission for the intestines to empty, and it requires no additional effort or input on your part. If the fecal material is moist enough, it will easily pass through the sigmoid colon, rectum, and out the anus. If the large intestines have removed too much water, in other words, that material has been in the large intestines for too long, then it will be difficult for that material to void, and it might require effort on your part. The effort 
put into a bowel movement that hopefully would never need to happen. It's called Valsalva's Maneuver. It's uh, basically increasing abdominal pressure to help push that material out. With appropriate moisture regulation, again, it, it, the feces can easily adjust its shape and easily exit the body. If the fecal material, especially on a regular basis, becomes too dry, then that's called constipation. So that's when too much water has been removed, and dry fecal material is not overly flexible. It's not easily voided from the body, and that's where you might need to put the effort in. And that really tells you that you need to increase your water intake, increase your fiber intake, which is non-digestible carbohydrates, and that will assist in keeping the fecal material adequately moist. And if you don't do that, you might suffer from constipation. That can cause diverticulosis, which is a stretching of the primarily the descending colon in little pockets, which can then become inflamed, swollen, and perhaps infected and cause problems. You might also experience uh, anal fissures. So let's go on here and look at the uh, anus. And what you might have is you might have fissures, and that would be tearing of the anus as that dry and too large and inflexible material passes through. So excessive stretching of the anal sphincter might occur. Uh, that's very common in young people, and as you age, because the muscles become a little bit more relaxed and flaccid, it's not as much of an issue in older folks. There's also the possibility of an anal fistula. And that occurs when an anal fissure takes place and then starts tearing deeper in than just being a surface tear. So let's say we had a fissure right here. It starts to tear a little bit. Then as it tears, if it tears deeply in, it might start tearing off down to the side here. Fecal material might then try to go into this new canal, starting to try to force its way out through a new anus of the body. And you really only need one. So the fistula... Unlike an anal fissure, which typically heals on its own in a couple of weeks, a fistula is fixed by having it surgically chopped off, and then everything is one happy opening again. Another possible problem here is hemorrhoids. So what they have labeled in this particular anus are some hemorrhoidal veins. So these blue veins here on the side are much larger than they're supposed to be. If there's excessive pressure here in the anus and rectum, that can cause blood vessels to kink off and sort of become blocked. Then the vessel behind the blockage starts to swell up like a balloon, causing a great deal of physical discomfort and pain. The solution typically is a hemorrhoidal cream, basically steroid treatment, which might be topical application of treatment. It might be insertion of a uh, solid steroid in the form of a suppository, or it could be both. Surgical solutions to hemorrhoids uh, might include banding, basically putting a rubber band around it, which then cuts off the blood supply. That tissue dies and falls off. They might go in and cauterize it, basically burn the tissue out of the way, or they could go in and surgically slice it out, depending on how bad it is, where it is in the anus and rectum, and what else has been tried and not worked. So in general, what we're saying here is you really want to make sure you have enough water and enough fiber in your diet so the fecal material stays moist and you don't have these sorts of problems. If we look at the overall digestive system in the abdominal cavity, we can see the liver and gallbladder and small intestines here. What we want to look at is the greater omentum. That's this yellowish layer of fat and connective tissue wrapped over the top of the whole system. And that's really there to kind of hold everything together. Because this tubing just seems to be really mashed in there, there's a lot of moving, a lot of twisting going on there, and the greater momentum sort of helps to hold it all together in one package. It's also a place where fat is readily stored, so all the yellowish, lumpy-looking stuff you see here is fat. And so it's quite common for both males and females, but perhaps males more than females, to store a great amount of fat in this greater omentum. And that often causes the pot-bellied appearance for folks who uh, perhaps are a little bit overweight because the greater omentum is storing a lot of fat there. For those of you who are lucky enough to be skinny, that means your greater omentum is not storing a lot of fat there.
the idea of defecation or actually allowing that bowel movement to occur is something that's run by the nervous system. And what you see here is you see sensory nerves at the end of the sigmoid colon that helps to detect pressure. So as fecal material accumulates in the sigmoid colon, it puts pressure on those nerves. They go back to the spinal cord and tell the spinal cord, we've got pressure out here. The spinal cord can then send what we consider voluntary signals out to the rectum and anus and tell it to relax. This then allows the contractions of the large intestine to push the fecal material out through the relaxed, opened rectum and, and anus and out of the body. At that point, uh, hopefully everything has worked well, but that's all a nerve thing. Now, an interesting thing here that often surprises people is that the large intestines are trainable. What that means is you can program the intestines to expect to have a bowel movement at a particular time every day. You can literally schedule it. And once a couple of days of regular bowel movements at the same time have occurred, you will discover the large intestines don't even ask permission for a bowel movement. They don't even tell you you need to have a bowel movement until that exact time of day, perhaps to plus or minus five minutes of the same exact time every day. And this is convenient because if you program the bowel movements to occur at a time of day that most often is convenient for you, then you don't have to suppress the desire of the large intestines to have a bowel movement on a more random basis if it's not trained. So if there's a particular time of day that's typically convenient for a bowel movement, make yourself have one at that time for a couple of days, and then you'll discover within a week or so that you've trained the large intestines to only ask for that process when you give permission. Sort of a handy thing. This figure just summarizes the digestive process and looks at what is happening to the proteins, the fats, the carbohydrates. What's going on with the enzymes? What kinds of enzymes are there and where are they coming from? So sort of a chart summary of all the different pieces and parts of the digestive process. So take a look at that. It's figure 23.34 in your book. Take a look at that and that sort of summarizes all the things we've talked about in one place. Here's just a little bit of a visual for fats. Because fats take a lot of work to digest, here's what's happening in the stomach. In the stomach, you have fat coming in from whatever the source was, and the stomach with the stomach acid forms fat globules. And those globules, basically large droplets of fat, are broken down into small droplets of fat. When those small droplets of fat enter the small intestines, you can see the bile here coming in from the liver, and it's going to attach to those very small uh, fat droplets and help to break them down into even smaller droplets of fat that you see here at step three which are then absorbable into the small intestines. So multiple steps required there to downsize fat to the point where it's something that can be absorbed readily into the small intestines. Then it can go to the liver and the rest of the body uh, for additional use and processing. If you have any questions about chapter 23, feel free to go to the Unit 1 discussion board and uh, post your questions there, and I'll do my best to answer them there. Also, starting uh, the second half of this week, I'm going to be having live uh, course meetings in Blackboard uh, through Blackboard Collaborate, and I'll put some instructions for that out here in a little while. But that will allow you to either call in or sign in through Blackboard and be able to talk to me live and uh, ask questions and, and talk about things live rather than trying to type out things. That might prove useful for us. So that will probably happen on the second class time of the week. So Monday, Wednesday classes, that would occur probably about 9 o'clock in the morning on Wednesdays give us a chance to get up and get woken up a little bit, and that would occur from 9 to 10. For the Tuesday-Thursday class, the 4.45 to 9.05 class, that would probably be at about 5 o'clock, so from 5 to 6 o'clock on Thursdays, 
that session would occur and give you that opportunity to ask questions and interact in a live format if you would like to do that. So again, more information uh, will be coming forth on that shortly. Thanks and have a wonderful day.